Exactly 45 years ago to the day, September 13th, 1971, New York State Police, they stormed into the Attica Correctional Facility and they ended the four-day riot there. 43 people died, 10 correction officers and employees, as well as 33 inmates. It remains one of the notable prison riots of all time. But the real history of what happened and why goes a lot deeper than the stories most of us know. Telling us that real story, the idea behind the new book, Blood in the Water, the Attica Prison Uprising of 1971 and its legacy, is author Heather Ann Thompson. I recently spoke with Thompson to learn more about that day. It's amazing. Um, uh, this week, uh, obviously, uh, uh, an anniversary of sorts, if you want to refer to that. Before we get to the actual uprising and the aftermath, describe the conditions in Attica in 1971, right before the end of August. Well, it was uh, extremely overcrowded. Uh, more than 2,400 men crammed into their cells, let out too infrequently, um, with insufficient food being fed on 63 cents a day, insufficient sanitary supplies such as soap and toilet paper and toothpaste, and terrible medical care. Uh, very uh, capricious parole rules, so someone could actually earn parole but not get out for a very, very long time because of the barriers to actually being released. Uh, myriad, myriad human rights abuses at that scale. A shower a week, uh, basically a square of toilet paper a day that would uh, a roll that would last a month. Uh, but the riot itself, even though there was a lot of protests um, and, and certainly aggravation on the part of the inmates and complaints that had been levied to the authorities, the actual uprising wasn't planned or intentional. It was born out of a misunderstanding, most likely, wasn't it? Well, I mean, indeed, I think it was actually uh, down to management, prison management. Uh, they had decided to deal with uh, a previous night's incident by uh, not allowing an entire company of inmates to go out to the yard for recreation. The problem was they hadn't even told their own guards that this was the plan, and so for this terrible few minutes, these Prisoners and guards are locked in a tunnel. Uh, panic ensues, uh, and it's in that panicked moment when everyone's afraid that the actual riot begins uh, and then, you know, spreads throughout the prison, but soon becomes not a riot, but really a rebellion when the prisoners understand that this is an opportunity to tell the world uh, what life is like behind bars. Then we have an uprising, and I guess it's in um, the D block area of the prison something altogether different occurs. One of the guards dies uh, in the immediate uprising, but then the prisoners get together. They decide to largely uh, not abuse the remaining guards, and they try and figure out what they want. In the process, they come up with a list of 33 demands, and I guess the most controversial among them was clemency for what would have happened behind bars. You have Bill Kunstler was a noted attorney at the time, also someone from the Times that were allowed, be allowed behind uh, the walls of the prison. Give an idea, this riveted America at the time, um, and obviously this in the middle of a lot of um, unrest in the country in the late 60s, early 70s. Talk about what this was like as it played out in real time um, across this country. Well, I think actually viewers, and there were viewers, there were television cameras uh, filming much of this rebellion and many news reporters, uh, there was a m remarkable degree of sympathy for the inmates, uh, in particular because even the hostages by the end of it were asking the governor to continue negotiations and to uh, to give these guys what they needed to have, uh, you know, normal, humane uh, living conditions. Uh, but then everything went wrong because the governor decided that he would not uh, come to Attica and ensure their safety, ensure that there would not be indiscriminate prosecutions, or what they were very concerned with was reprisals, physical reprisals, and, uh, and as a result decided to take the prison with force. Those moments are crucial because the, the world turns against uh, uh, prison reform ultimately in part because of the way that the uh, state government spins what then happened next. Well, before we even get into the aftermath, Governor Rockefeller, who we're talking about, go through from what we've learned, what was his decision, A, not to go behind the walls and to meet and negotiate, 
But moreover, what was his state of mind? That this was, was there a bit of naivete? Was it that, you know, I won't be forced at the end of uh, a gun or at the end of a bat here to negotiate? Why did he decide at the end of the day not to negotiate with the inmates, given that everybody was watching and it was foreseeable that this was going to end very badly? It is remarkable that he decided to retake the prison by force, considering that the entire uh, observer team that was assembled there, 201, was telling him that that would result in a massacre, and that was uh, their words. Uh, my research sort of behind the scenes indicates that he had really been planning to retake this prison with force from the beginning, indeed was perhaps only delayed because the uh, there was an observer's committee there, um, but ultimately made a decision that uh, was against the advice of everyone on the ground, uh, surely to uh, to tell the world, the nation, but really his own party, that he was as tough on crime as, uh, say, Richard Nixon. Uh, Rockefeller very much wanted uh, uh, to be president, and um, this was his line in the sand, and in fact chose that path knowing, and this was another important reveal in my book, knowing that he was going to end up killing hostages. In fact, the McKay Commission, uh, which was the first of what would be many state panels to review what happened um, in the retaking of the prison, they said in point um, that it was the, quote, bloodiest one-day encounter between Americans since the Civil War and even the Indian massacres, and this one obviously only one was armed. Uh, talk about what happened in what was really only a 15-minute exchange. You have tear gas there. There did seem to be indiscriminate shooting, but what surprised me is Rockefeller would entrust the retaking to people who really seemed ill-equipped to do it. Indeed. Um, these troopers, uh, nearly 600 were sent in, but they had spent four days outside of the prison, uh, riled up, lack of sleep, passing out weapons indiscriminately, uh, not recording serial numbers of these weapons uh, and connecting them with specific officers very deliberately. And then they get sent in. Uh, at, but this is after the D yard where everyone is assembled, including the hostages, is saturated with a tear gas that is in fact a powder. Uh, that gets in everyone's nasal passages. Everyone is incapacitated. They are retching. They are falling to the ground. That's when the armed assault takes place. The prisoners don't have guns. The hostages don't have guns. And law enforcement in 15 minutes not only shoots thousands of bullets and spray of shotgun pellets into this space, but indeed has ripped off its identifying badges uh, so that when it goes in, uh, specific prisoners can't later on identify who subsequently Subsequently, will carry out uh, torture in, in D Yard. You know, Heather, I've spoken um, over the years to families of, especially correction mm -hmm. officers, who were either lost that day or served significant injuries. And what always shocked me was sure, they thought the initial deals that they felt that they were compelled to sign for very small um, uh, compensation would happen that day, but they were asking for things like basic psychological treatment that would be subsidized exactly. or an apology or an acknowledgement that what happened that day shouldn't have happened that day and even if you take the morality and the ethics out of it i never understood the logic why there wouldn't be an acknowledgement that that's not how it should have happened that day and especially right. you know for the correction officer families that that little part couldn't have been acknowledged by the state by not just governor rockefeller but subsequent governors that followed him i never got right. the logic even politically, why you wouldn't want to do that. That is why when you uh, come to the end of this uh, this book on Attica, you're sort of left a bit stunned that at every level uh, of government, uh, from the lowest level workman's compensation clerk all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States or the Justice Department or the White House, everybody with power that could have stood by these folks, uh, taken responsibility, in the case of the prisoners, stopped the abuse, in the case of the hostages, uh, given them the care that they needed, um, some form of restitution for the for the lifetime losses of income and family support. Rather than anyone take that stand, uh, they fought these people for 40 years. So this is a David and Goliath story of people who, who just refuse to give up. But today, even as we speak, the state of New York still has not admitted responsibility for what took place at Attica. And in many ways, the legacy, obviously, of Rockefeller tied to the Attica uprisings and what we We've learned since and what you document, but also 
the Rockefeller drug laws. In many ways, they were a contributing factor for what went uh, to the overcrowding in that prison to that day. And even in the 45 years since, we're still talking about what makes up the prison population right now. A lot of it was born out of that legislation. Absolutely. And uh, I think that readers will be surprised to see that who they might expect to have been in Attica in 1971, um, there was an overwhelming number of folks there because they were addicted to drugs and needed a public health solution, not a criminal justice solution. Um, they had uh, people in there who were you know, young, 18 years old, 19 years old on parole violations. And so this picture of who we have in Attica is very much tied to a policy which is ramping up uh, and incarcerating more and more people for social illness that would have undoubtedly been better addressed outside of the criminal justice system. Well, there's many people, as you'd imagine, that wear black hats in this, but there are so, also are some heroes, uh, people who went beyond where they needed to go to talk about what really happened. They're documented at length in this book here. Fascinating read. Again, blood in the water. Uh, Heather, I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Coming up next, we'll take a look at some local headlines, so please stay with us.